Good evening. My name is Samuel Cotton. The film you're about to see is about a practice that most people believe is a relic of the past. It is a film about slavery, about chattel slavery, about the buying, selling, and breeding of black Africans by Arab Moors. It is also a film about racism and about a violent program of ethnic cleansing, a program designed to destroy the culture of the people who were once the original inhabitants, a program designed to destroy the people themselves. Slavery has existed in Mauritania for many centuries. It's institutionalized, it's part of the culture. From 1969 to 1978, a huge number of slaves fled the countryside for the cities. However, in 1981, despite the loss of a large number of slaves fleeing to the city, after a visit to Mauritania by the London-based Anti-Slavery Society, it was calculated that the country holds a minimum of 100,000 total slaves, 300,000 part slaves and ex-slaves. Slavery con continues today because legislative enactments have not been accompanied by the necessary legal and social edicts to change this situation. Our journey begins in Senegal. I arrived in Dakar on January 23rd, 1995, and I left for the refugee camps the very next day. When traveling through Senegal, one realizes that this is an African country with a deep love for Islam. Every few miles, a mosque can be seen along the road. These religious structures literally dot the landscape. Sadly, these places of worship remind me of the terrible reasons black Mauritanians are suffering in the camps we are on the way to see. For despite Islamic law, religious hypocrisy and racism rule in Mauritania. Racism has its origin in the first contacts between Arab Mauritanians and black Africans and the relations which were thereafter established between the two. The Arabs came as drought refugees, invaders, traders, or missionaries. Black people have been enslaved on such a scale that the term black has become synonymous with slave in Arabic. Systematic destruction of black culture and civilization became the order of the day wherever and whenever the Arabs gained a foothold in the country. They distorted and falsified black history and achievements while glorifying their own. Blacks were pushed to the bottom of the social, economic, and political ladder. We are arriving now at the refugee camp Njum. These camps, located near the Senegal River, are the result of the intense racial hatred that white Muslims in Mauritania have for their black Islamic brothers. White Muslims, the Baydanes of Mauritania, began to ethnically cleanse in April 1989 their fellow Muslims solely because they're black. They also subjected the blacks to a nightmare of beatings, rape, and murder. This occurred in a country that not only practices a form of apartheid, but in addition, engages in the chattel enslavement of its fellow black worshipers of Islam. The quiet, desperate life the refugees live in these camps belies the terrible events that brought them to these godforsaken places. A Lutheran relief worker who desires to remain anonymous tells us what it was like when they first arrived after being driven across the Senegal River. Good that they haven't even cut their breasts and done really bad things. And did they cut their breasts mm -hmm. or did they cut it off? They, they, they cut big... Uh, Pieces of meat out? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, I've seen one guy here, he was in the hospital here in, in, in Senegal because he was really in a bad shape. He, they had... Uh, how do you say? Tied his tied, ankles? Tied his ankles and you could still see where a ro rope had been tied his ankles and they, they had tied the rope to a car and they had been pulling him on, on the sand and he, he was all his face and all his body was swollen he was really swollen, swollen. Uh -huh. yeah and and I tried to see if he could feel something on his leg he couldn't he couldn't feel anything on his leg and he was really really in a, in a bad shape I meet with the men of the camp and we discuss the problems of living as refugees and the difficulties facing the people in Mauritania. As Farabah and Mesaud Boulher stated, 
Mauritanian Arabs do not follow the law of Islam when it comes to enslaving blacks. The Arabs practice a selective morality and maintain a clear conscience toward Allah when buying and selling blacks. Masaud produces a contract for an African woman and her child that serves as a metaphor for this perception. The contract, produced in Arabic, was translated into English. Listen to the wording of that contract and its selective morality. In the name of Allah, most gracious and most merciful, salutation and peace upon him, Muhammad Val Ud Nima, son of Sidiba, bought from Muhammad Limin Ud Sidi Muhammad, son of Talib Ibrim, a slave with her daughter named Kiniba, in the price of 50,000 Ugia, or 30 U.S. dollars. Therefore, it becomes effective, his property of the two slaves listed. The two parties did receive my witness, and the buyer accepted before the hidden defects of the slaves. The contract was made at the end of the month of Haja of the year 1412, our 1992. God forgive me and my father and all the believers. When Jabada Mint Malud was seven years old, she made a mistake and allowed one of her master's animals to be eaten by a wild animal. For this, she was severely punished by having her hands tied harshly, and then she was hung from the center post of her master's tent. She hung there many days and was not allowed to move her legs. When she was finally cut down, her hands were in terrible condition. Her master sent her to a healer who tried to save her hands, but Jabada states that they became very big and started to stink. Everyone in her master's village would complain when the wind would change because they would smell her hands. Since her hands were useless, she was expelled by her master. But her mother continues in slavery today. She was brought to this meeting to show what happens to slaves when they are injured or become too old or useless. I met Achiana Mint Abid Bulil in the Mauritanian version of the Underground Railroad. She was in a one-room safe house, hiding from relatives her master had sent to bring her and her children back. In an interview conducted by Candlelight, she told me her story. I am a 30-year-old descendant of a slave. I have experienced this condition since I was born. I need to make the world aware of the hectic time in which I have been living which is the separation of my five children who have been kept by their master. The conditions that we lived, myself, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, my father, my cousin, and my child was very inhuman and we are like animals. I have been in the service of Muhammad Ul Moisa, who also has the name of Ul Ahmed Dea. Muhammad Ul Moisa has slaves working for him. He also rents or lends them to his relatives and friends. That is why my oldest daughter, Salma, 14 years old, was lent since she was four years old to serve Moisa's mother-in-law. At the same time, my second daughter, Elbara, 12 years old, was given to Beda Mint Mohammed Ul Mosa. The daughter was given to the master's daughter when she married with a man who worked for the administration. She has to go everywhere this family goes. Uh, you want, he, she wants to explain, your she wants to explain how her son was killed. They had two, two cars, Toyotas. They had two, two cars. cars. And then they, 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 they tied one leg. One car. They tied one leg to one car and the other leg to the other car and then they started the cars and they tore him apart in two parts. That is the way my son has been killed. It's horrible. We are not Muslims. We are, Muslims. We are, we are not animals. We do not want to be ashamed. 
We want the people to have justice. We want to lead you to have justice. We claim justice. We, we claim justice. justice. We demand justice. We demand an inquiry, an independent inquiry. We demand an inquiry to reestablish justice. That is what we will ask for today and tomorrow. It is clear that the world is ignoring the murder and enslavement of the children of my ancestors. I have come home to the land of my forefathers and confirmed that African flesh is still cheap and for sale. Africa's present is her past and her past is her present. As in the past, the Africans in Senegal and across the continent stand and watch in silence the historical mistreatment of Africans by the Arabs of Mauritania. In the United States, the African-American political and spiritual leadership ignore the issue. To come to understand this reality is a form of death. There were parts of me that were alive before I experienced this evil, parts now dead or silent. There is, however, one thing I am feeling as I sit here in the shadow of Gory Island. I feel the need to scream because of the perennial mistreatment and enslavement of black people. This film is that scream.